Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 128. We're now in the days that are very fascinating and interesting and powerful days. Because on one hand, we're still in the month of Av, which is the saddest month in the Jewish calendar. We begin with the three weeks that began on the 17th of Tammuz, concluded with Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, with the beginning of Av, the beginning bulk of the first nine days, called the nine days, the Tisha Yomim from Reish Chedesh Av to Tisha B'Av, the saddest part of the Jewish calendar. And as we know, the Jewish calendar is not just a calendar. It actually signifies and reflects and mirrors the cycles of life. That's why time, time which is a creation as we've been discussing, time itself is energy. And every point in time has its energy. The Zaya says, and the Pasuk, Six days God created heaven and earth. It should have said, in six days. Because six days, that's exactly what God created. He created the six days too, the six energies. Every day has its power. So, the, so just like the month of other reflects the cycle of reaching the highest point of a person's life, joy, marbim besimcha, of reflects my mayatim besimcha, diminishing in joy because of the destruction of the temple. And yet, as we come from Tisha B'Av, the moon continues to grow. Until the 15th of Av, which was last Friday, the moon becomes full. And the Mishnah says in Tainus, at the end of Tainus, that there were no holidays in Israel like the, like the, like the holiday of the 15th of Av and Yom Kippur. What's the comparison of these two? Yom Kippur, we all understand, is the holiest day of the year. So the Gemara struggles with finding different reasons what happened on the 15th of Av. That is Al comes, whose uh, Yotzeit is also in the nine days, the fifth of Av. That is Al comes and teaches us that on the 15th of Av was commensurate in direct proportion to the Yeridis, to the great descent of Tishabav, which is a Yeridis Peloim of Malchus, as the language is, and it's also brought in the Maimon Nachamu from Eter, from the Rebbe Rashab, that in direct proportion to the, to the descent and the fall and destruction of dignity and Malchus, on the ninth of Av comes the, the rise of Malchus and the Levana and the moon on the 15th of Av. That's why it's greater than the 15th of Nisan and the 15th of Tishrei, and the 15th of Adar, which are all full moons and all have holidays in them. But this one is the transformation. Yom Kippur is the same idea. Yom Kippur came after the building of the golden calf, literal betrayal, idolatry. And 80 days Moshe Rabbeinu spent, 40, 40 40 days he received the Torah, 40 days he prayed, it was not successful, and then the final 40 days, and he comes back with the second tablet, Salah Tikidvarecha, that God says, I've forgiven you as you've, as you've spoken, as you've asked, as you've requested. It's hope after loss. It's rebuilding after destruction. So therefore, we're dealing now in a cycle of, uh, of time where we're on, the re- we're on the mend and the rebuilding of our, psych- our psyches, a psychological makeup. So in the context of Chassidus Applied, that's this period that we're in right now. Going from the 15th of Av, and the Gemara's reasons actually become, become really un- appreciated and understood. And of course, the one where that, one of them was that on the 15th of Av, they stopped dying due, due to the Xera, the decree that happened again on Tisha B'av when the Meraglim, the scouts, came with a bad report. And it became a Pchil, a Datus, a crying for centuries, for generations because of what they cried that night due to the libel against uh, Israel, against the promised land. And other, other reasons as well, as the Rebbe explains in a number of sikhs, about all about unity. So Tubov becomes, also as the Gemara gives the reason, Yem Tabar Magal, it's the day when the nights start getting longer in Israel as the summer winds down. And as a result, because the sun is not shining as powerfully, the wood that was brought in the Beis Amigdash was not as dry, and therefore would not be as perfect. So they stopped, they came to Abba the day that they broke the axe. It was an expression of saying that they no longer cut down the trees for the wood that was needed in the base of Migdash. And that's why, as the Gemara concludes, that we begin to learn more, because gives the night was given in order to study. The night is a more reflective time, a more 
quieter time, time to study, to introspection, for introspection. So we begin, called the Man Yesif, the Yesif, like he says there, we begin to increase in study of Torah. So all this is reflection of the rebuilding of Malchus, the rebuilding of the moon, the rebuilding of Israel, rebuilding of the human psyche. And as it builds, we go from Tubav, we then, this builds into the month of El. Next Shabbos will be Shabbos of Orchem El. So this isn't just a bunch of incidental elements. It's all part of a process. The Jews leave Egypt. 50 days later, they receive the Torah. 40 days later, the, they, the, the tablets are broken due to the, break, due to the building of the golden calf. Moshe Rabbeinu goes back, on, goes back on the mountain to ask for forgiveness. 40 days later is Rosh Chodesh Elul, where he comes down, so far unsuccessful, or as we shall see, becoming successful in 40 days later, after the f- first day of Elul, 40 days later, is when Yom Kippur. And as I mentioned from the Shalach, so the sites, the month of Aryeh, the month of Av is Rosh Tevis, Aryeh, the Leo, Lion, is El Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Yishayin Rab. So it's all part of a structure. It's a structure that builds and reflects our own structure. So we all go through this on a psychological level. We have our ups, we have our downs. And the downs are meant to lead to a greater high, a greater up a greater ascent. You read the Tzedek Chaliyah. So there you have a certain type of lesson in this period of time. As well, of course, the lesson of Pasha Ekev. Ekev is from the word Ekev, or from, also from the word the heel. Even though Ekev also means because, the cause of the different interpretations. But we're also in a state of like, like Ekevus of the Meshicha, which is the heel of history, meaning they're coming to the end of Golis, and we enter into the time of Mashiach. Again, the same idea. That it's always darkest before the dawn. But then the dawn begins to break. We have the Gili, the revelation of Chassidus, and other changes in the world that all signify the time of coming where the moon will be repaired. And the Begam Halavana, the wound of the moon, will be healed, as well as the wound of uh, the entire Knesset Israel, the entire world, and by extension, and come to a point where there will be a full moon, which signifies, of course, the Gula, so there you have, a, in brief, a cycle that we're in right now that's extremely um, applicable from the point of view of chassidus applied when you think of it in personal terms. What I've said now is taken from the different discourses, including Nachmu Eter that I mentioned, and many of the Rebbe's talks on connected to Tubo of the Rebbe's, as always the case, took these days that seemed less, uh, less uh, known, less famous, so to speak, renowned in the Jewish world, and turned them into, not turned them, he didn't turn them, he revealed the power that they have, and the power that they have in our personal lives especially. Teda from the word Teda, Lash Nehira, applied, applied Teda, applied Judaism to our personal lives. I also want to mention, the next Wednesday will be Chafav, which is the Rebbe's, of course, the Rebbe's father's Yotzeit, Tavshin Dalad, when he passed away in Golis. And the Rebbe's father has many lessons. The Rebbe spoke for every Fabreng and every Chafar Fabreng, and there were many different things the Rebbe spoke, always made a Hadran. And of course, the style of the Rebbe has certain elements that are, you could see, are derived from Rabbi Levi Yitzchok's style, which is the Rebbe's father's style. And going back to the Samech Tzedek style, if you can call it style, each one has their approach of how they bring together all the different parts of the Teda as the Rebbe has in the letters that the correspondence that we have from the Rebbe and his father, fascinating correspondence. And one of the points that the Rebbe's father makes to the Rebbe is that what you write is as is, is powerful as Ga'inus, always connected to Kabbalah to make sure that it's kafter befera, beautiful and rounded and, and balanced in that type of like a, uh, a seamless, a beautiful concept. But something that stands out, especially in this context, in this context, it's also in the month of Av, is of course the famous Hashimah that the Rebbe's father wrote in Golas. We see today the colors of ink that the Rebbe's mother prepared because he didn't have ink. And he would write on sides of the Zayar and Tanya and other things. And he wrote us also a Hashimah that's printed before the, his, his notes on Tanya and in several places about his own life. How it was a life filled with Gvuras. Levi and Yitzchak, his name, are both Gvura. Yitzchak, of course, is Gvura. Levi is Gvura. And he shows how every moment, the, the time that he spent in Golis and the different places in prison, everything he sees in it, the divine hand of, of, of Gvura. And uh, the, the month of Av, of course, is a month of Gvura. 
And yet, Chafav is what is 40 days before Rosh, Rosh Hashanah, as the Rebbe points out from Sfarim. So here too you have a man who suffered so greatly. The point that when the when the picture when a picture came to the Rebbe and they showed a picture they were going to print it in the Kutli of Yitzchak when the manuscripts came out of Russia in the early late the early 60s. So they showed the Rebbe a picture of his father and the Rebbe wrote, "Me, who's, who is this?" He didn't recognize him because he suffered so greatly. So his face changed. Later we have another picture which was also taken when he was arrested, but it's a picture more closer to and more similar to what he was what he was remembered by the Rebbe as. So a man that suffered so deeply, and yet what did he do? He transformed the suffering, besides the fact that he sat and wrote, that had the composure and the presence of mind to sit and write, Chassidus, Kabbalah, and so on, and, and, and pages of which, which we only, they say, we only have a small amount of what was really left. Also how he interpreted his whole life, even the challenging moments, the most difficult moments into something that at the end of the day is a reflection of the divine. Hein hein gvuresov, perhaps the gvuras of the divine. And out of that came, of course, the Rebbe, son of Rabbi Levi Yitzchak and Chana, and the Rebbe Tzachana, and the Rebbe that we talk about, our Rebbe, and, the, and that the, this, this episode would not exist, this My Life series, nor so many other pow- powerful things that are happening. All the result and outgrowth of the Rebbe being the Tzachanich in such a home. I'll just mention one more, one more interesting in Yud Aleph Nis and Tov Shem Test. From the few times that Rebbe would speak about it, spoke about himself. So he mentions that, uh, he was saying that, that he was asked, that Rebbe was just speaking then very sharply about Ezra and, uh, Sol and not giving up land for peace, etc., etc. So the Rebbe said that uh, he was asked by someone, because people were, some people called, insulted the Rebbe. They, uh, they, they spoke derogat- in, der- in, a, in a derogatory way about the Rebbe. So the Rebbe said, someone asked me, am I bothered by the fact that people are speaking negatively about me? People that were the, crit- the critics. There's Fabreng and the Rebbe says, it's recorded, you can hear it. And the Rebbe says, to say that it doesn't bother me, I can't. But to say that it bothers me to the extent that I'll stop speaking, I also can't. And the Rebbe goes on and says something very interesting. He says, and where did I, basically explaining where he got this, this, uh, the stolz, this, uh, this uh, confidence, and not to, not to speak when you have to speak, even if it's, uh, people don't like to hear it, and people criticize, he says, so the Rebbe says, I, I was zeich, I was zeich, and not due to my own efforts and not to anything, the Ebesh says, I was the Bukhar, I was the oldest of my family, the Rebbe was the oldest of the three brothers. And, and, um, and he says, as a Bukhar, so my father, who was a Rav Arashi, the so-called head of Rav Arashi of Yekaterinslav, which is today the Nepa Petrovsk, Yekaterinslav. So as a Rav Arashi, people came from from all different places with questions, with discussions, and so on. He says, being a Bukhar, uh, I was sent some of these issues, especially the more, the more seem, seemingly uh, distasteful ones were sent to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe said, I was also someone who knew different languages. He says, and that's one of the things that the critics talk about, that I know different languages. He says, the Rebbe says, I am not going to hide it. First of all, it won't even help if I hide it. I'm not going to hide it. He says, I'm not embarrassed of it. He says, I don't, it's not in them, the Rebbe says. It's not my thing. It's not in them. Like, it's not like my priority. But to say, don't deny it, I'm not going to deny it. Like many of them, my critics, who will deny it. But yes, I knew languages, the Rebbe says. And therefore, my father would send certain people to me. And some of the people were people like the cynics and the skeptics. And some people who uh, would, would say things that were negative. So they're basically saying that he already got used to people saying things negatively and not being affected by it. So the Rebbe goes on. So, so therefore, from then already, I've developed into someone that to, 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 to not look for things for COVID. It's not a thing I'm looking for is honor. Um, and, 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 and on the other hand, to go ahead, and, and, and the Rebbe continues then and says these very powerful words. He says, so looking for honor, I've long given up on. You know, to, to, to look for dafka that people should speak negatively, I'm also not looking for that. But, not, not for this was I educated and, and, and nurtured and brought up to be quiet when there's something that's affecting Jews. Koch nefesh, something life-threatening. It's a very powerful expression, and the Rebbe is expressing, not not in that for that, for me to sit by and by, by and, and be silent when I see something that's wrong, 
And therefore, even though there may be critics, I still do it. So it's just a nice, uh, nice, a powerful way the Rebbe expressing growing what kind of home he grew up in and what he was and, and what helped shape, shape the Rebbe. Even though, obviously, the Ebishter shapes a tzaddik and a Rebbe, but the environment is also part of it, of what you see and what you grew up in. So Chofov is a tribute to that, as the Rebbe every year would, would, would uh, honor that, and we honor it as well as a result. And, of course, the Kibbutz that the Rebbe said for years, that he was unable to really fulfill Kibbutz and that's why the Rebbe was so grateful and expressed it in many ways to anyone that did anything for his father. And, of course, the Rebbe writes a number of places that Chofov is a day, is my chiv and my schus, my responsibility and my merit to, to encourage people to learn the Torah of my father. And the Rebbe, especially in the later years, began to, in my modern and not many places, refers to the Torahs of his father to the point that every Fabrengen, the Shabosim, beginning in Tov Shalom at Aleph, the Rebbe began explaining um, a piece of the, a piece from his father, whether it's on the Zayar or sometimes it was earlier, it was on Geras HaTshuva. But bottom line, this was the way the Rebbe honored it, and therefore it also fits into the whole discussion of going from Gvura, from the Gvuras of Av, to the Chsodim and the, and the Rachamim, Chedesh Rachamim, the compassion of Elul, as we bless Elul this coming Shabbos. Okay. With that, let us go into some specific questions and some follow-up. Question, first, let me read some feedback, which has become also one of our customs here. Toda Rabba, Rabbi, for your wonderful teachings. It was good how you answered these many questions at such a high and practical meaning for our lives. Wonderful. Regarding last week's episode 127, the title of the video does not do justice to the other very important subjects spoken about in this video. I guess the person just, listen, when a title is a title, you can't write everything in the title. So maybe the good news is that when you see the titles, know there's always more in store than what the title suggests. And, uh, and hopefully uh, don't, get, don't let the title um, hold you back from, uh, from listening because if, the different topics, people have different interests and different topics that we cover. Thank God it's quite, quite diverse. And this is a direct, uh, direct, a direct outgrowth and, uh, and appreciation to all of you out there who are writing the questions, because I respond to those questions. And the questions continue to come. Myself, my office, and team are all amazed how there are more and more questions. And I guess that reflection of life and its reflection of when you take this and you apply it, it just elicits more uh, questions and more uh, discussion on topics that are relevant to us, which is a good opportunity for those that are listening for the first time, or uh, or uh, just to remind you to um, submit your questions at meaningfullife.com forward slash my life. Questions are completely anonymous. It's a form that, that we have no way to trace. So you can write any question you like. And as you know, I try to not censor or in any way uh, mince words and try to address every topic possible in the right, in the right spirit, and of course, in the right edelkeit, and hopefully in a refined way. Another comment, so inspirational and interesting, much to learn from a person of such caliber who presents his teachings in such a pleasant manner. Another question, last week we spoke about whether women can learn chassidus like men. So someone writes, can men learn chassidus? Really so sexist, the question itself. So there's a response to that, this was online. Someone writes, I believe the subject is in response to women who have been learning chassidus in depth and have uncovered a lot of amazing giluim that remain hidden in plain sight waiting for someone to notice. However, most women in general are not ready to believe that another woman can actually grasp chassidus on that level. So Rabbi Jacobson, as a shliach from Hashem, is assuring them that yes, women can do so, and perhaps even more so than men. So not sexist at all, just validating. Absolutely right. It's not about um, this. The question may seem that way, but people do have this question, and many people may have a misunderstanding. That's why I wanted to make it very clear. Sometimes you have to state the question clearly. This is not suggesting and making any, any patronizing uh, point that women need to be, we need to justify that women have to look at this, but it's just simply clarifying the point, and I hope it was taken in that spirit. I want to also add, regarding Chafov, I did discuss it last year, episode 78, more points about Chafov, so that goes into what I was, I was speaking earlier about Chafov. Okay. Next question. Well, not next question. After the comments, let's start with the first question, actually. The importance of wearing a beard. Thanks for your classes. I've gained much from them and look forward to each episode. I'd like to ask, 
Can you explain the view of Chassidus on the importance of wearing a beard? I'd like to know more about it so I can have a discussion with friends about it when the topic comes up and be able to encourage them not to touch their beard and to be honest, understand it more myself. I know the beard corresponds to the Yud Gimel Midas Harachimim. Those are the 13 attributes of divine attributes of compassion and mercy. Can you elaborate more about that as well? I, I basically can just, I'm, I will refer you to several letters. There's many letters from the Rebbe about this topic, um, obviously with all the sources. So firstly, let's begin, of course, Chumash itself. A beard is not something, some type of custom. It actually speaks directly in the Torah about not, for a man not to touch the beard, the payas. And there's discussions exactly what that means. The end of the Hetarim, the, any type of permissiveness that was allowed regarding shaving a beard was either due to the times or due to Xeda's decrees and so on. Some for Parnosa. But it was always clear, as the Rebbe writes in some letters, even though it may sound simple, that if you imagine Meshur Rabbeinu, Aaron, Avram Avinu, you imagine them with a beard. Everybody draws them with a beard. Because it was a common thing. It was the sign of a sage. It was the sign of, of, being, uh, of reverence. It was the sign on a physical level, this was, and of course it's coming from the Teda itself. That's the Psukim. But it's not Exodus Akosov. In many places it talks about the power of a beard, especially in Kabbalah, and especially in the Zayar, about like you mentioned, Yud Gimel Midas Harachimim. That's the source of Brochus and Amshochus. A number of months ago we spoke about hair in general. Uh, let me see if I have here. Yes, the episodes 52 and 53 about hair. I was talking about women's hair and different, but hair plays a key role in Jewish thought. Of all, all types of hair, you have the Nazir, the, the Nazarite, the, you have the, the, the negative elements of a Mitzayda shaving, the Levim in the Midbar, and of course women covering their hair, long hair, short hair, payist, beard, etc. So here, and I'm not, this therefore I'm not going to go into the whole spiritual discussion of what hair is. You can go back to episodes 52 and 53, but it's not some type of trivial thing. And when you're talking specifically about a beard, you're talking about the baruchas and amshachas that come from a beard. There was a, a couple went to Yechidus once, and they were having difficulty having children. So the Rebbe looked, I mean, said it, I guess, in a sensitive way, says, says, to the, says to the couple, you know, akin chapton chapzachan in abard. When you're holding a child, the child grabs your beard, as anyone who has children or grandchildren knows. And the man, of course, didn't have a beard. So he understood the hint, and he went and grew a beard, and they had children a while later. I remember the story, I remember when it happened. So a beard is a source of brachas. And uh, so I'll refer to a few letters. Igris Kedish, there's a letter in, uh, it doesn't say here, the volume. Oh, letter, Igris Kedish, volume 6, page 285. Very strong letter. Where the Rebbe says that uh, that he saw a person come into Merkis who had t- taken off his beard. And the Rebbe speaks about the divine image, the Tzalem Alekim, and the Baruchas that come from it. I'm not going to read the entire letter. It's a strong letter. You can look it up yourself. Volume 6, page 285. Then there's a letter from the Rebbe. It's actually dated 29th of Av, Tavshin Yud Beis. There's another letter from the Rebbe in... Uh, I don't have the volume. I just know the date. The 13th of Av, Tavshin Yud Ches, 5718. And that letter in, uh, in volume 6, um, do I have other sources? So the Rebbe at the end there has a PS and says, Our Nesim have elaborated, elaborated upon the prohibition, prohibition of cutting one's beard, and he brings it to Machsadik. The sources shall also true here today, actual physical, actual, the actual page and uh, uh, chapter and verse with all the sources on this topic. Now, of course, there was a Hadras Pnei Zokan was a safer uh, compile recently um, where it brings all the different sources from Nigla and Chassidus and from all the modern and modern contemporary G'dayli Yisrael, not just Chassidim, about the importance. So you could look it all up. These are, these are books that talk. I, I don't need to go summarize them all. But to just sum it up is that based on the Psukim and based on the Zayas and based on the G'dayli Yisrael, a beard is a critical component in the Jewish Salam Alekim image of God that's on our faces. And it also designates the G'ein Yank of the pride that we carry it, so you don't have to try to assimilate or look like others. This does not, it's not a point here to critique those that do not have beards. It's not what we're discussing here. 
discussing what the virtues are. And people have to study that. The more you know, the more you make an informed decision. Of course, there's the famous story with Rabbi Weiss, Rabbi Weiss, Rabbi, Rabbi Weiss, a businessman from California who I knew is actually a supporter of ours. When I began my career, he was my first supporter. And he, for many years, did not have a beard. Then he chose to grow one. And I remember by Fabrengen, the Rebbe said, I'll tell you the whole story, actually, before we get to that. So in the early 70s, after Shvira, where he grew his beard during the Shvira Seimer, between Pesach and Shvuz, he decided to, to grow a beard. So it was by the Rebbe in Yechidus. And he asked the Rebbe, what does he think about this decision he made? So the Rebbe said, it's a big decision, because remember, once you've been growing it, you can't cut it off again. In other words, once you go to that level, it's not something you should take lightly. So when you get home, consult with your wife and follow what uh, you both feel. So that's what he did. His wife wasn't so excited about it, so he never ended up growing the beard. This is the early 70s. In 1983, Shavuos, he was here for Shavuos in, in 770, by the, uh, um, and by the Fabrengen, those Fabrengens, even though they began before the Shkia, meaning before Yontav was over, but we would, we would because of when Yontav would end, let's say an hour, hour and a half after the Fabrengen began, but the Rebbe was still Yontav, so he couldn't record the Rebbe's words. So what we did was, before Yontav, we would paste, we would uh, tape um, a pad and paper and pen under a table, underneath where the Rebbe sat. And I would sit right up front, right under where the Rebbe sat up on the platform below. And uh, when after the Tzese Kachob, after we were able to make Hamavdil, I would take the pad and paper and write, actually write as the Rebbe was speaking. So I remember sitting and writing, and the Rebbe suddenly says, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a Sikha, that when a person makes a decision to grow a beard, so because a beard is Yud Gimel Midas Harachim, the 13 attributes of compassion, new channels of blessing open up, and his Parnassah will become 13 times as much as what he had before. And it was like, you see clearly, Rebbe was speaking about something specific. I mean, it was connected light, slightly to what he was discussing. And I right away thought of Mr. Weiss, as he would call himself, and uh, since I was a, co- a friend of his, after the Fabrengen, the Rebbe was giving Kesha Bracha, I went over to his apartment and I said to him, was this about you? He said, yeah. He says, and it's a miracle. Because he told nobody, he says, it was the second day of Shavuos. And he was sitting by davening. And he said, the Rebbe turned around and was looking, when they t- taking the Sefer Torah to the Torah reading, to the Bimit, to read the Torah. He says, and he was so taken by the Rebbe's image, he made them write their Nachlata. I'm going to start growing my beard. Or I will not cut it because he had the growing was Shavuos, so it was right after, again, the days of Sphira. That was the decision, he says. I told nobody, not even up Shmuel Duvid. Shmuel Duvid Reitschik was the shlich of the Rebbe in California, who was close with him. He says, I told nobody, not even up Shmuel Duvid. He says, and then the Rebbe in the middle of Fabrengen suddenly makes that statement. I told no one. So obviously it gave him even more strength. He said that later I heard from him, he came back home, and he didn't say anything. But he wanted to know what his wife's reaction would be. So he sent in his son and says, ask mommy what she thinks. So he went and asked his mother. And his mother says, he looks very good. I like it. Okay, that was one hurdle. When he went back to work, to the bank, wherever he was working, uh, and he, uh, and, and you know, people were looking, but no one commented. So he called and he said, John, his assistant, and says, son, what are you, what, what are you, what, what's going on? He says, everyone's interested. You look so distinguished, Mr. Weiss. So he realized it's the right thing to do. It wasn't looked at as strange and as weird, and he grew his beard. I think I asked him what happened with the 13 times as much, and he told me it was more than 13 times as much. So just an interesting anecdote in this context. Uh, I, I believe in the spirit of Chassidus, this is not meant to be divrei musr. I'm not here to talk rebuke or uh, in any way reprimand. This is talking about the positive elements, the Rebbe's sikhs and the Rebbe's words about it, the Rebbe's letters which of course is based on the Tzamech Tzedek, based on before, it's not the Rebbe's idea, but the beard and the brachas that come with the beard in response to your question. So I suggest looking up these sources, and I also mentioned the Sefer, Tiferes Kenim. Um, did I say Tiferes Kenim? Hadras Pnei Zokim, my, my mistake, I said Tiferes Kenim, I'm, I'm confusing it because the Rebbe, the connection to Chafov and Tavshin Nun Memalaf instituted the Tferes Kenim Levi Yitzchak, the Kalim for people who are retired, or we don't like to use the word retired, but are out of the work, the work world, 
to continue their growth and learning. The, the safer is called Hadras Panei Zokim. So I correct myself, which of course refers to the beard. But it's an excellent safer because it collects everything together. Okay, next question. The next question is, since we're talking about, I guess, garments and uh, beards and, and, and dress, well, beard is not really a garment. It is a garment, but it's a garment that grows naturally. So let's go to garments that don't grow naturally. That will be the segue. The question is, how important are the garments that we wear? Aren't garments just a superficial thing? Why does it seem that so much emphasis is put on externality? And uh, why does it seem that so much emphasis is put on externalities when we should be concerned with what's going on inside, beneath the surface? Okay, so I have discussed this topic in episodes 90 and 91, but there's another angle that I want to discuss that I have not believed discussed then, which is a very fascinating mimer from the Alta Rebbe and from the Rebbe. Um, but I want to begin with an introduction to strengthen the question. I heard this story from a um, person who was a Gerer Chassid, and he uh, lived in Crown Heights in the early years. And that was when the Rebbe was living on New York Avenue, New York and President. The Rebbe and the Rebbe lived there before they moved into their house, where we, the house that we know of on President between Brooklyn and New York. So it was a Friday afternoon, and he was a boy, he told me the story, that he was a boy, and he was going, as it was, it was custom then, Fridays, many of the children would go, a few times a year, they'd go around collecting some money for the yeshiva, a raffle, selling tickets, or whatever it was. So he, one of the houses he went to, one of the buildings, was New York Avenue. And he went to different houses, everybody was Jewish, and he rang the bell, knocked on the door. And he came, comes to the Rebbe's house, this is before the Rebbe's Rebbe, so it was before Tafshin Yud. And he knocks on the door. And I think the door, Rebbe said, the door is open. Come in, if I recall correctly. He walks in. And, uh, and the Rebbe sitting there. He says he sees the Rebbe sitting in a, in a chair, learning. It's Friday. Friday early afternoon. He comes over and he tells the Rebbe what he's looking for. So the Rebbe, I think, gave him something. The Rebbe says, what do you do? What, what, what are you learning in Yeshiva? And he told the Rebbe what he's learning. And, and they started talking about something. I, I don't think he told me what it was about. The Rebbe asked him a question. Then the Rebbe said, do you have any questions? So he said it was a chutzpah a little boy. So he says, yeah. He sees the Rebbe sitting there not, without a jacket on. And he was learning. So he says, surprised to see a Jew sitting and learning without a jacket and a hat. So the Rebbe called him over and smiled and said to him, I want to just tell you something. Ba'unz and Chabad is negea mervas tutzach unter de levushim vi av de levushim. That by us in Chabad, it's more important what happens under the garments that on, and then the garments. In other words, the primius. And he left. He said, I have to tell you that the years passed on when I got, the years rolled on, I got older. I had many challenges. And one of the challenges was exactly that, what's going on under the garments, not above the garments. And I remember the Rebbe's words. It's a point that I really got myself into big trouble. He didn't, he didn't specify, he didn't go into detail. He says, but that line remained with him. And yet at the same time, we see Levush does have value and does have power. The Rebbe himself wears a Levush, Chassidim wear Levush garments. I remember once someone coming to one of my classes and asked me, why do you Chassidim wear this black and white and this type of garment? So I said, you know, when an astronaut goes into space, would you also ask the question, why do you wear this uniform? He says, no. I said, why not? He says, because it's a dangerous place. And the uniform you need to protect from the elements to protect from the non-gravity, to protect from other things. So I said, well, you know, a chassid sees his life as a mission going to space as well. He comes to this world, and the comes down to this world, it has many challenges. So part of the challenges, there's, a, there's routines that we have to do, different mitzvahs, different customs, different traditions, including garments that are part of preserving our integrity and, 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 uh, and projecting the correct message of walking with dignity. The Gemara tells in Zvachim, the Rebbe cites it often, about how one of the Roman uh, ministers, one of the Roman leaders, when he saw one of the Tanoim walking, he went off his horse and said, and helped him lift up his gartel that it should wear. He says, because you're taferis, you are mamleches kein and v'gei kot. Excuse me. Jews are mamleches kein and v'gei kot. You are a priestly people. You have to look to feris, the cover the look to feris. And we see in the Torah, the big day kahuna, the garments of the kahuna. What's so important in the garments? The main thing is the service. 
because externals matter in this world. But not to worship externals. If you only have external, you don't have internal, obviously something's majorly lacking. But that the internal should also reflect on the external is a big part of the picture. So we have to have a balance here. But in addition to all this, here's a maimer. A maimer that was said by the Rebbe, Chazarover. So you know, especially in the early 60s, there were new maimerim coming out from Russia, discovered maimerim from the Alta Rebbe especially. That's when they printed Masef Maimerim. And other books then, also with a the grant that came from the claims conference. So there you have one of the. So the Rebbe would often speak about. You could see that another Ksavyad came out, and he would chazer a mimer based on one of these new manuscripts that was discovered. So in the in the year Shabbos Chalamayt Sukkis Tov Aleph, which would be 1960. And I should also, the Rebbe said a maimer, it was like a sicha maimer, maimer ken sicha. And also, a similar, the similar theme based on this Alter Rebbe's maimer, the same maimer, lay yikonof of Shabbos Beshalach that year, Tov Shechof. So that year, meaning this was Tov Shechof Aleph, but the English year was the same, in the 1960s. So earlier, Shabbos Pasha Beshalach also. So you have these maimers. So in this maimer, the Rebbe brings the Alter Rebbe's maimer, which is now printed in Maimori Admur Azok and Ketzorim. There's a, safer, there's a series called Alter Rebbe's Maimorim, and one of them is called the Short Maimorim, because these are the Maimorim, many of them, most of them said in the years before Yutas Kislev, as is, as it's indicated there. So they're concerning their short, their short discourses. Later, the Alter Rebbe began saying longer ones, relatively longer. So in this Maimor, he talks about this. And the Alter Rebbe brings, it's a very fascinating piece, Sefer Maimorim, I'll tell you what page it's on, page 144. And the Rebbe explains this maimer in a very interesting and powerful way. So he's, the Rebbe, Alter Rebbe says the levushim garments conceal what's on the inside, to the point you cannot see the difference between good and evil when someone wears garments. In other words, some of these, you can be a very one type of person and wear garments that reflect something complete opposite. And he brings two examples. One example of a ishshete, a fool, who 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 hung around the Chacham, a wise person, so he can speak and make believe like he's wise by speaking wise things. So it appears to everyone around him that he's a smart person, but in truth it's just a garment. He's just speaking something that's not really him. Another example, the good deeds done by a person who's fundamentally and by personality is a, is a bad person. So there again, people can think he's good because he's behaving in, in, in a good way. His, his speech the speech, that behavior is action, and action is the levushim seem good, even though it's covering up something which is mechur mo'ed, very ugly, very dis, very despicable, very distasteful. The Alta Rebbe then continues, where is the power for such a thing? How could it be possible that a garment can have such power? So he says, that comes, it says in Mova Shiyarim, that levushim is an Indian amok. There's something very profound about garments. Now, I've not found this Mova in this in these in the places where this is cited, they say in to my different Maimorim, Tafri Sadiq Tess, other places. But Mova Sha'arim is usually referring to the Arizal. Kisra Arizal is a safe called Mova Sha'arim written by Rabbi Chaim Vital. I will go through it, but if anybody wants to do a little research and find it, it would be great what it says in Mova Sha'arim. But Mova Sha'arim could also refer to by the Alta Rebbe, maybe some other Sfarim. Most likely it's the Arizal, but uh, this needs to be looked into further. Then comes the Alter Rebbe's Messiah, he says, Lo yekonef eid meirecha. What does it say? The Mashiach comes, Lo yekonef eid meirecha. Konef is a garment. Is it like a, like a, like a uh, garment? Yeah. So, Lo yekonef eid meirecha, that your meirecha, your teacher, will no longer be concealed in the garment. The Alter Rebbe also cites it in Tanya, Pei Vov, Dvav, chapter 36. meirecha. You'll see, the eyes will see your teacher without any uh, garment in between that will filter or block it. Why? So al Rebbe says, because then there will be no more garments of biyah, that will conceal a lakus, and therefore the midas and meichen will be in their purity, clear, emes, as they are truthful without this distortion. So the Rebbe, in the, in the, in the, when he chazered this maimer, added a few key points. And one key point he says is why does he bring the two Shalom? Because he's referring to Midas and Mechen. 
Chacham is Meichin, of course, the person who's saying Chacham even though he's not a Chacham. And Midas is the person who's behaving in a nice way, and, uh, but, but not necessarily is a nice person. But then the Rebbe says this main Chiddush, he says, that um, the fact... That the fact that the Alter Rebbe brings a Levushim, you could think, means ostensibly that it's an external thing. But in truth, you see from these Mishon that Levushim make, make a difference. It can create an impression of something that's not correct. So the Rebbe turns around the meaning and actually turns around and says that the fact that it's an Indian Omuk, something very profound about garments, is because garments actually can change somebody. When a person who's a fool speaks wise things, Ultimately, those wise things can turn the person to become a wiser person. That's why there's emphasis, even in our time, before the Gula, that the externals can taka be concealed and they can cover up and they can distort what is lying beneath, but they can also help a person grow. Because if you're not holding there yet, at least do it on an external level. And that's what the Al-Tareb is really means. That the Levushim could also help a person grow. So it's not just about that it deceives us and loss is lovely in the future, it won't. But even today, garments have that power. And he brings a story of the Alter Rebbe. It's a story, a uh, famous story, that there were people who came to the ta- Taina with a complaint to the Alter Rebbe that his chassidim are being mighty and filled, they're davening long, and they're mahadir and mitzvahs. When they don't, we know they're not holding on that level, it's only an external thing. So how can it thereby? So the Alter Rebbe responded, so halavai, it should be fulfilled in them the Psach HaMishnah, the Mishnah's words. What is the Mishnah? The Mishnah in Peya, Peya Ches, Mishnah Tess says, that a person who's wealthy and behaves like he's a pauper, ultimately, God forbid, will become like that. So the Alter Rebbe said, Merubah Midateva, how much more so on the positive? That if someone's like a pauper, someone who is not holding by a certain level, behaves in a way like that level, then ultimately he'll become that way. So we see that externals can actually affect what we call is that hadeus hadeus which means when a person actually behaves some a certain way, that behavior can actually lead you to become that way. So behavioral psychology has that power. Behavioral change, and that's why we don't always say if you're not holding, don't do it. No, there are places where you have to know your level and not jump and not do things that are beyond completely beyond. But the fact is, externals can affect internals. I once heard from a major fundraising advisor, he said that people think that when it comes to fundraising, people's heart follow, people's investment follows their heart. That's why you try to convince somebody that they should give something. He says it's not correct. People's heart follows their investment. That's why he said this, that you try to get somebody to commit. Once they give, then they're more committed to give more because their heart will follow their investment. Similar idea that sometimes an external, the behavior is what will lead to a deeper appreciation. And then, then of course, we'll come to a point where that the garments will not be there to conceal. They'll only reveal something much deeper. But that doesn't mean that the garment cannot be part of the process in this, in this, uh, in this growth. So I thought it's a very powerful and interesting element in the concept of garments. Next question. How to balance fun and higher purpose? Okay, sounds like a fun question. So here, <clears throat> the question goes like this. Are we all capable of the balancing act making a dira betachtenim demands? How can one enjoy life while aware that there is a higher purpose? Thank you, Rabbi, for taking the time to answer each specific question and giving each question attention. This question I've been, I have, I've been wondering about for a long time. In Chassidus, growing up was taught things like walking down the street, should say Tanya or Mishnayis. Always try to elevate sparks in any situation you encounter. Honestly, I feel choked and confused. On the one hand, we are here in this world, not angels. We have the Gashmis here in front of us, physical. How much can we enjoy and be part of it and, and when, when, we try to, and when, when, we do, when all we do is try to elevate it? Hope I'm being clear. I feel like I don't live in the moment because I'm afraid that I should be doing something spiritual. How do I find a balance? How can I go about my living my life knowing that I can partake in this world through clothing or experiences, etc.? Yet know that it is okay by Him, by Him being God. 
Thank you in advance, and I look forward to some clarity. Well, this is based on, uh, the question is a good question, but it's based on a fundamental flaw. And that fundamental flaw is really one of the foundations of, uh, the, the foundation of Chassidus, Ahdus Hashem. The Torah does not ask us to just abstain and refrain from engaging in this world, period. Torah says, engage in the world, but transform it. So many of us think we have to compartmentalize. Here's where we have fun. And here's where we are involved in Torah, Mitzvahs, and Gedusha. That's not, that's a duality. That's a compartmentalization. The truth is, is that Le'elam Hashem, the truth is that Le'elam Hashem Dvar Chunitzu B'Shamayim which means the world is renewed every moment and every part of existence, every fiber of existence has divine energy waiting to be released. So if you ask most people, you say, Tzadik? Ah, Tzadik doesn't have pleasure in life. All he is is dedicated to service. It's very boring and very unappealing. I, I am not a Tzadik. How do you know this? Maybe a Tzadik has the most pleasure in life. What means most pleasure? Not pleasure indulging in his needs, but in fulfilling his mission is part of what he enjoys. So a little child enjoys playing with toys. An adult may enjoy reading a book. And someone who's dedicated to God enjoys bringing godliness into this world. So number one, it's not a contradiction. It's not a contradiction. It's a contradiction only when you see the, the two, two, uh, par- two a duality, two different uh, realities in this life. That's number one. Number two, I would go a step further. That when you really understand the purpose of why we're here, then the things that are called fun, the things that we enjoy, become even richer and more profound because they also carry in them a deeper purpose. So let's take now. Now we're in the summer months here in this hemisphere. People go on what's called vacation. Enjoy themselves. Relax. No one does it say that a Jew cannot relax and also fulfill their spiritual mission. So this attitude, which is unfortunately sometimes projected on us by people who are either guilty or they're projecting their own um, insecurities or their own compartmentalization, is that, you know, something, if you're doing t- something that's too much enjoyable, something's wrong with that. So yes, we know so this is the concept of iskafia, to refrain, to abstain, to not indulge in everything. We understand that. But there's another part of life, which is, especially today's day and age, is not to just punish yourself and to afflict yourself. Ozev Tazev made to work with the physical world. To be able to do something which has both fun, but also has deeper meaning. What's the contradiction? You're on vacation, you're meeting people. Enjoy what you're doing. Of course, I'll be Allah and I'll be Teda. But you also have an opportunity to meet people. Say something, speak to them about something. Your Shabbos in a bungalow colony. Your Shabbos in a vacation place. Your Shabbos at some... Retreats. It's not just indulge in the food, the drink, and the socialization, and socializing, and the other good positive elements. It's an opportunity to engage with people, to learn from each other, to grow, to inspire, to be inspired. What's the contradiction? So, in the context of uh, the famous story with Rab Chaim Rappaport, with the Rebbe Rash, the Baal Shem Tov said that the water was waiting from the beginning of time for you to come to make a bracha on it. He drank the water. The water refreshed him. But in addition was the dimension that the water was waiting for you to make a bracha on it. So wherever you go, the world, that part of the world is waiting for you to come there. Not just to have fun in your own fun, but also to do something and elevate it. What's the contradiction? So it's important to understand that Al-Pikh this. We don't have a compartmentalization. Of course there's a lahavdul ben kedush l'chayel. We have to understand what is the means and what is the end. We have to understand what is... Um, uh, materialism as an end in itself as opposed to using it for spiritual reasons. But when the Rambam says that Lo kola when Mashiach comes, El Hashem bovad, that the entire business of the world will be only to know God, he doesn't say there won't be other business. He'll say that it'll be with the purpose of knowing God. Today, business, you can do material gain and make money and success as an end in itself. Then we'll know that the whole material success in this world, including the fun we have, including the seemingly... Uh, say frivolous, the seemingly external things we do, as I said before about garments, is all for that deeper purpose. So what you have to do is retrain your mind and understand that having fun is not a contradiction to being godly. And on, and, and on the contrary, if it's fun begashmis, again, then it, it could be reflective that it could be fun beruchnis, 
What means fun? Meaning that it's something that is coming from a deeper place. Physical sweetness comes from chesed, from spiritual sweetness. Physical pleasure comes from spiritual pleasure. The Baal Shem Tov says that even when we enjoy food, when we have certain tastes, is because our neshama craves the sparks of those tastes. It's not a contradiction. The contradiction is if you separate the two and say this belongs here and this belongs here. So there's a duality where you're indulging in ways that, that are not appropriate, and then you have your moments when you're doing something that's holy. Another form of duality is simply saying these two cannot join together. They could join together because they're all part of one God's plan. Okay, next question. Dealing with opposition from within. I watched a video of some Jews harassing a group of Naturi Kartim who were peacefully holding a sign saying something to the effect of down with the evil occupiers Israel, give the land to Palestine. I apologize for reading it, but this is a question someone's writing, so I'm reading as is. Regardless of the Naturi Kartim position, which really hurts me every time I see it, how should one conduct themselves in the face of opposition from within? Meaning Jews against Jews, so to speak. Should we be more of a Pinchas and just go for the jugular, regardless of repercussions of whose feelings may get hurt, which is what some other Yidin did, ripped the sign out of their hands and screamed in their faces, or should we take what I would think is the Rabbi Akiva approach, which I guess in this case would be to just ignore or maybe even enter into a discourse about it. An excellent question. And what can I say? Sometimes it makes your blood boil when you see these things because you see how Jews can be the worst, their own worst enemies. I mean, I know some people of that world that have a very misguided view, even if they have certain opinions. Who says you have to go out in public and make a chil Hashem to march with Palestinians? It's the equivalent of marching with Hitler because he's burning down a reform synagogue that you don't like. These are our enemies, the enemies of Jews. Period. And they wouldn't make a distinction between one Jew and another when they, God forbid, when they attack. It's not like they say, oh, in the we won't touch, but we'll only touch Jews that are, are... And we know that long before Israel became a state, there were still the, the pogroms, and all, all Jews of all colors and shapes were attacked. So the whole thing is a distorted, to the, a distorted and misguided, and I don't have words, it's despicable, actually. And it, te- and it tests us greatly, because yes, it makes your blood boil. You know, sometimes I see it and you want to just like, what is this? Like unbelievable. This, this is what we need of all things to march with enemies. Even if you have some ideology that maybe have some legitimacy to it, which is another discussion whether the ideology is based on. But the way it's expressed is definitely not legitimate. So you could dismiss these people as being something wrong with them, something disturbed, but they're doing this in public. So it's a very good question. How do you address it? So to turn the other cheek and make believe it's not happening, no, I wouldn't necessarily say that's the way to go. Obviously, not you, everybody can do what they want. You can't control these people. But if you know someone like this, to just ignore it, I would definitely try not to focus so much on the ideology just to say, how could you, you know, there's a thing called a chil Hashem. Chil Hashem means that people are perceiving that you are an enemy of other Jews. Now, if you can get through to someone in a kind way, obviously that's the first option. To do, to fight, to fight to something despicable with something despicable is also not our approach. So no, I wouldn't do something that is uh, violent and also not in public for the same reason, because it create the same desecration. So it's not an easy one to respond to. I would just say that, that in this case, the key thing to me is the desecration part. Ideologies look could argue in a base medish, we could sit from behind closed doors and argue our, our issues. But I d- b- feel that these people definitely are <laughs> in big trouble and need help. So I think it like this, if my brother, I'm saying this just as an example, not suggesting my brother is this way or my brother is, but if someone I love, my family, would be like this, I would try to talk to them. Sometimes you have to yell at them, again, in private, Sometimes you have to, to do whatever it takes to try to co- communicate. But these are more more challenging situations, which I would put into the category of people who just are closed-minded and are impossible to talk to. What do you do? So at some point, you know, you have to choose your battles. It may not be a battle you can win, but definitely to try. So definitely I would not take the approach of doing anything that is uh, going for the jugular 
regardless of repercussions, no. I don't think that's a tailored approach. I would, the other approach is to do whatever you can in kind ways and nice ways to educate someone who's completely uh, off base. And then the same similar would be the equivalent of, you know, I don't want to compare it, but let's say you meet an anti-Semite, Jew or non-Jew. What are you doing? They're convinced. They're convinced. So it's the same thing. You can go try to argue. Usually if that doesn't work. I would try to kill them with love, so to speak. I don't mean kill, God forbid, in a real way. I meant to say to overwhelm them with a kind approach and a positive approach. And what do you got to lose? Either it'll help or maybe it'll open some doors. So I'm sorry I don't have any deeper uh, answer than this, but I'm just being practical how you deal with difficult people and people who are just close-minded and have their crazy way of looking at things. Okay. Let us go. One more question. Empty nesting and loneliness. I have a question. I listen daily to shuyurim of yours and others. Shuyurim are classes. I think it's a symptom of my loneliness, though, as then I don't have any contact with people. My children are nearly all married. I have a husband. I go to an old age home weekly to light up the faces of the elderly people. Still, I feel this crushing loneliness. Shabbos is unfortunately the worst day. I wish I could have practical tips on what to do. Well, let me give you a few tips. First of all, what you're doing is beautiful. You go into an old hedge home to light up other faces. So why don't you do more of that? If you have the time, why don't you have guests see your home at Shabbos? I mean, it seems to me, you say you have a husband, but it doesn't seem like there's a he's part of this equation here. What's going on there, I would like to know. Is there a way that you and your husband can engage more, can excite your lives more? As I said, bring guests in, go to, other, go to friends, travel, Maybe visit your children that are married, obviously with their welcome and so on. There may be more than going on here that meets the eye, and I can't comment on things I'm not aware of. But based on your question, there are many things you can do if you have the time. Thank God, or thank God, or maybe not thank God, but we have challenges, everything is thanking God, but we have challenges. There are many people that can use a lit up face. There are many people who can use words of consolation or words of comfort. There are many people who could study. So find things that you're active in, and they don't have to be escape. You're listening to the shiurim, don't see that as an escape. See it as an empowerment for you to then go out, and why don't you give your own shir? You can't give a shir. Find someone to study with, maybe someone to teach you. The main thing is stimulation. The antidote to loneliness is stimulation and passion. To do things that are exciting, that are productive, that you feel at the end of the day have accomplished something. So without knowing more, this would be my so-called generic answer to the question as it was posed. Okay, let's now go to a follow-up time question, then we'll go to a chassidus question, and then the essays. So last few weeks, two weeks, I was speaking about time, so here's a follow-up. Rabbi Jacobson, thanks for your great weekly classes. Last week we learned, Rashi and Parshas Devarim, that Eretz Yisrael Gavayim Mekola Arotzes. That Israel is higher than all the other lands. It is clear that this means spiritually higher, as there are other lands, mountains, that are physically higher. Based on what you taught regarding the relationship between time and space, and based on this teaching that Israel is spiritually the highest, why isn't the physical land of Israel the land of the rising sun, the land to start the new day? Why is Israel located in the middle of the world, ensuring that other countries have started their day time before Israel? First of all, let me just, it's a good question, but let me just say this. You know, the land of the rising sun, every land is is the land of the rising sun because every place the sun rises. Now, to go to the place in the world where the sun rises first, where where, where is the first exactly? The sun, the world is a globe. There is no first. The Japanese teach their children we're the land of the rising sun. Every place thinks they could say we're the center of the universe. The sun rises when it has to rise in each place, as we discussed so, geographically, you could actually say Israel is the most strategic place. It's right between Europe and, and Asia. It's by the water. It has all the qualities. And it's Harim uh, Abkoyis. And it has Eretz Zav Eschol of Vidvash. a beautiful land with a diversity. It may not have the highest peak, but it definitely has the lowest, which is the Miyama Melch, I think, is considered the land, of the, the place with the lowest, the lowest sea level. But the point being here is that first of that the, the question of uh, what, where, where's people start their day, you know, that 
everyone starts their day when the sun rises in their, that place. But your question is still a legitimate one and a good one. I want to address it from a different angle, which is why Gashmis doesn't always reflect Ruchnis. Now, if, if you listened last week when I spoke about time, I referred to a Sikha in uh, the Rebbe speaks about the Tkufis, Rab, uh, Rab Ada and Shmuel, the different opinions. The Rebbe says something very interesting there in volume 16 in Lukut Sikhs, page 98 and on. And it's actually later reprinted in volume 22, page 234 and on in, in Hebrew. It's printed in Hamoyer in a magazine called Hamoyer, the Torah magazine, journal, Torah journal. And there are some additions. And the Rebbe says there that because the physical world is not completely aligned with the spiritual, there can be an, a misalignment of how things come from the spiritual into the physical. And he actually brings the Shulchan Aruch of Madura Basar that I cited last week from the Alter Rebbe, and says that there's a completely different explanation there, but you can reconcile that there is an inconsistency. Now, there's a few other places that Rebbe says a similar idea. In volume 7, page 155, Lakut is volume 7, that even though Chassidus uses the example for Eir and Moir, for the luminary and the light and energy from the sun, but there are differences because the physical world is not completely aligned with the spiritual. So there'll be distinctions between the moshal, the moral, and the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the moshal, the analogy, the metaphor, and the moral. Also, in, cha- in volume 23, Lakut Sikh is page 39, where the Rebbe speaks about Rufus, healing in our times, there, there are things, Nishtanawe Itim, that today you can't apply all the, the healing that was, that was applied in times of the Talmud, and he asked the same question, isn't the Torah eternal? So the Rebbe says also there's an inconsistency sometimes, the world is not always aligned, so you can't say, so even though spiritually these things are true, they don't always manifest in a physical way until you're Zeicher, that the world is aligned. I would add that there's something similar stated also in Agar Satshuva chapter, um, uh, chapter 6. So in chapter 6 he says there why, it says in the Gemara that a person, Kodis was what was Kodis. Kodis was Misi that when a person turned 60 years old, that's when someone, God forbid, who was... Who's, who had the, who who, was, um, who transgressed a sin that deserved kodesh would die. But we don't see that happening. Many people, the Alter Rebbe asks in chapter four there in the Gersa Truva, they live on. So he says because when things were in a holy world, the world was aligned. So when it was aligned, it something could not continue to exist on this earth if it wasn't aligned with heaven. But because the world became more coarse, and it's under the control of klipus and negative energy. So paradoxically, what can happen is that you can have a world that's not aligned exactly with the holy... It's almost like saying that a human body that's already toxic can, can take toxins in. A pure body it will repel and be, can be killed and destroyed by toxins. But once we become desensitized, you can then you become more immune to what? To unhealthy things. So the material world could sometimes not reflect. And maybe that's why some things in the Gashmis are not always reflective of the Ruchnis. I just wanted to add that into the equation. But it's a very good question and probably deserves even more discussion. Okay. Now. Let us now go over to the Chassidus question. How can Chassidus talk about levels before the Tzimtzum when the Eitz Chaim states specifically that before Tzimtzum there's an Ein Sof Poshet, a seamless and shapeless divine energy that has no distinctions at all. So it's referring to the Eitz Chaim right in the beginning. Eir and Sof Mamalakol Amitzias, Eir Poshut. Divine consciousness was the only thing that existed, and there was no room for anything else. Comes the Tzimtzum, conceals that divine consciousness and presence on the reveal on, 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 on the revelatory level. As we know, not Tzimtzum Kipshute, it's not literal, and it's not in the higher levels; it's only on the lowest levels. To allow space for existence, how do we speak about levels before the Tzimtzum? We say it in Sof Infinite Tzimtzum, we say there's ten hidden spheres, and we say there's a Kedem Alei Sarotzen, Alei Sarotzen, and the Eir Etzim Eir, Ispashtus Eir, Eir Legalis Laatzme, Eir Legalis Luzulase, levels upon levels. An excellent question. So firstly, there's a direct letter from the Rebbe that answers this question in Lekut Esichis, it's printed, it's a letter from the dated Yud Ches Tevis Tovshin Tes. So it was written before the Rebbe's Nesias. And of course it's printed therefore in volume 1 or 2, probably volume 2 of Igris Kedish. 
and it's printed in the Kut Tazov, volume 15, page 473, 474. And the Rebbe says, the person asked this question, Eich Shaykh Lemer, how could you say in Er Lifniyad Simpson that there's levels? It says Er Pashat, Mom is this question. So the Rebbe answers that when it says Pashat, before the Simpson, it means relatively speaking. That everything that we talk about or order and hierarchy and structure is after the tzimtzum. But and before the tzimtzum, relative to that was pasha. But the Rebbe says, but it's not pasha tamiti. Because re- and the Rebbe says you have to say this because real pshitus is only agdus abshuta. You can't even say there are two things. But as soon as you say something that's more than atzmus, you say even divine consciousness, you're already saying there's at least two things, the thing and the thing that created it. So you say there's oyer, you're saying there's oyer and there's moyer. So it can't really be called real pshitus. And the Rebbe goes on to bring a bunch of examples, and most importantly, and goes even deeper, that from the perspective of the boyer, everything is pashat. That's what the Lifnei Tzimtzum, that you sense things from the divine and everything therefore is equal. And he gives an example in Aveda of an Eved. It doesn't make a difference what you do. You're doing what God wants you to do. But Mitzad Giluyim, from the perspective of Revelation, there can be distinction. It's worthwhile reading this letter. It's a very powerful letter. But the end of the letter, or the end of answering this question, the Rebbe says, In Kama came in Levada. Here's not the place to explain what's not understood. L'chayda. What caused Lifniat Simpson the distinctions in Eir? Since there's only Hu Vishmay Levad. So what caused that distinctions? So that's for another time. So that's the letter. So let's now go over to the essays. The essays, three essays, and I'll do this quickly because of time limitations. The first one's Olympic Dreams, Goals for, Goals for Gold by Esther Kosovsky, 55 years, Shluch in Western Massachusetts, Long Meadow, Massachusetts. Ashgacha Pratis, Olympic dreams, using the Olympics and the and the and the with a long analogy to c- compare it to the Yiddish and Hashem Baguf, the analogy that we have in our lives. So you can train, and then you make that you make mistakes that come through the free will, all using this to explain how we can succeed in our lives. So this essay, like others, can be are all posted at meaningfullife.com forward slash my life forward slash essays hyphen 2016. It's basically a comparison with a very long analogy about the competitions and a relay race and someone dropping a baton and how that reflects in our own Aveda and our own work. Okay, that's number one. Number two was I Am a Soldier in the Army of Hashem by Benjamin Dave Moshe Newmark, 47 years old, Law Enforcement Corrections in Naples, Florida. And here, an interesting, similar, takes... The idea of, a, of, a, of army, rank, structure, and modality of different soldiers. And uses that as an example, as a moshal of Tzibus Hashem, of being a soldier in God's army. And it goes through a detailed analysis and comparison of the example of soldier and, and in an army to be serving God. It's a short essay. And that's essay number two. And finally, essay number three, Leave the Past, Live the Present, by Yeshua Herzfeld, 24 years old, Tefer's Bachur in Maristan. Okay. And this one is really applying Siddhis to the concept of PT, PTSD, which is post-traumatic syndrome, post, post-traumatic stress disorder, sorry. And he uses a Tanya, a Tanya and a Maimer, I think in Teir Eir, to explain this, and, uh, and how one can apply Siddhis to dealing with the challenges of PTSD, essentially using the concepts of Bittl and Esabcha, um, based on the Maimah that I mentioned in Chayavin of the Bishuma. So those are the three essays. And with this we conclude My Life Chassidus Applied Episode 128 until next um, Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. It should be a bench to Chedesh a month of Chedesh Harachimim, and the Ebishter should bench us all as we go over the cycle from uh, the Av, Tubav, Chofav, and Tashash of Archimel and El, a year of uh, we should have the Gula Amitiz Vashlema in the full moon and the full healing of all the fractures of this world with the coming of Mashiach. Thank you very much. This has again been my life, Chassidus Applied. Be well.